Steve Ratner, Willett Advisors Chairman and CEO, takes us through the tentative agreements the UAW has with all three automakers and what they might mean for the auto industry overall. I think it's a good outcome for both sides, actually. I think the union got what they, most of what they, much of what they wanted and much of what they deserved, which were substantial pay increases. Uh, they got COLA, cost of living adjustments back, um, the right to strike in certain places, things like that. Uh, and I think from the standpoint of the companies, what's really important is that there was no backsliding on work rules, on all the restrictions that made it hard to manage those companies before we restructured them in 2009. And they also did not go back to defined benefit pension plans or uh, company paid retiree health care, which of course everybody would like workers to have, but simply isn't in the playbook anymore. In, the, in, the, uh, in today's economy. What about that flexibility? Because earlier on Wall Street Week, you weren't warned about those work rules because you had to deal with those back in 2008, 2009. There were, there were some agreements, such as, for example, the right to strike, as I understand it, for any individual plant closing. Do you think this will still give the auto companies enough flexibility to deal with the really changing environment in autos? Yeah, I do. I think the thing that the union uh, has to be careful about is, as we've talked about before, the yin and the yang is that when you increase pay, increase costs to the companies, they're talking about eight or nine hundred dollars a car potentially of increased costs, what, what can happen then is the jobs can move. That the next plant doesn't get built in the U.S., it gets built in Mexico. And that, the right to strike does not prevent that from happening. And that's, the, and that's what's been happening in the auto industry for the last 15 years, the number of the jobs have been moving. It's not a coincidence that the big three companies essentially don't really make small cars in the U.S. anymore. They cannot afford, they simply can't make them with any kind of reasonable profit margin given the cost structures they have. So we all want workers to do more, but we don't want it to cost jobs, and that's the thing we have to be really careful about. What does this mean potentially for the finances of the company? I mean, it will be more money, as you just described, for the companies. The companies that got, said going into this, yes, we're making a lot of profits, but we're investing an awful lot of that in the move to electric vehicles, which is very expensive. At the same time, there seems to be a little softening now in the appetite for those vehicles. It looks like people are extending that time horizon out, which obviously makes it more difficult. If your payback doesn't come till later, it makes it hard to make the investment now. So let's unpack that, because I think there are a couple of good points and questions in what you said. With respect to making electric, electric, the, the capital involved in making electric vehicles, I don't worry too much about these companies. They're making very good profits at the moment. Uh, their balance sheets are in good shape. Obviously, we restructured them. They've been prudent with their finances. They have the capital, and this agreement isn't going to significantly diminish it. So that connection I, I, don't, I don't find troubling. I think what's going on with EVs is another question, and it's an interesting one, because, yes, what you're saying is certainly my perception that consumer demand interest focus on this whole issue has sort of diminished a bit. By the way, also the stocks of companies in these industries have also diminished a good bit. I think there was a lot of, you know, excitement and maybe hyperbole uh, about EVs and then people sort of started doing the math and, you know, gasoline prices came down a bit and stabilized and actually on an inflation adjusted basis, gasoline prices are roughly in the midpoint of where they've been for the last 50 years. So it's not enough necessarily to drive people to EVs, so to speak, no pun intended. And, and so, yeah, there's been a little softening of demand and companies are going to have to figure out how much to invest. Uh, what the current outlook would be for uh, purchases. Come back to your point about uh, com competition moving to Mexico, moving to right to work states. There's also competition from non union uh, producers, for example, of Teslas, you know, for electric vehicles. Uh, it, does this put uh, the big three at a substantially greater disadvantage? to the Teslas of this world, and also some, some of the Japanese automakers who, as I understand it, also don't have unions. Yeah, it does. There's no, no getting around that. If you increase your costs of a car by eight or nine hundred dollars, you're at a disadvantage. And I always forget to mention Tesla because it wasn't really around in 2009. I was thinking about Mexico and the southern transplants. But Tesla is absolutely a factor in this, and companies like Tesla that don't have unions and pay substantially less. And again, that's the yin and the yang for the unions to think about, because if General Motors and Stellantis and Ford can't be competitive with Tesla, then they're going to lose jobs. They're going to lose sales, which means losing jobs. And, and you can have the right to strike all day long, but if uh, the company ends up closing a factory or reducing the number of shifts, that, that's what's going to happen. Are we looking at industry overall, over time, we're just going to have less employment, the way we did, for example, in coal or in steel? 
Yeah, I don't think we're going to quite get to the coal or steel levels, which are essentially now a shadow, a fraction of whatever they were at their peak. But yeah, I think, I think it's very possible for any combination of reasons that the number of jobs in the auto sector won't grow and may, may well shrink. Uh, that, that's entire, but that, look, that, is, that, is, that is part of what we have to accept. Preserving old jobs that have outlived their usefulness is not a recipe for economic success for anybody. You have to go with the change, and the unions have to accept that. Over time, there may be fewer jobs. Hopefully, they'll pay well. And hopefully, as a society and as an economy, we're going to find other things for those folks to do who can't work in auto plants anymore because we just don't have as many jobs.